So my name's uh, Lewis Blackall. I'm curator of the Supermaterial Exhibition upstairs, and I'm strategy and development director of the Built Environment Trust, which is the organization that, behind the building center. Um, so this is one of our series of talks uh, that go over the Supermaterial Exhibition, being generously supported by Tremo, which makes it possible to do it all for free. We are doing videos of these talks, uh, which is one of the reasons why we're a little bit late starting. So it is being videoed. You will be able to see it all later. Um, if you have any issues with being in the video, keep your head down. Uh, but there we go. Um, we, we'll be having four speakers. Uh, we'll have some questions after the four speakers. We will then have opportunity to go upstairs and see the living brick exhibit, which is one of the things we're talking about during the, during the presentations. Uh, and so two of the speakers have been directly working on that. Uh, so you can go upstairs. There's a bar upstairs. You can have a nice networking time and, and smell the exhibit, if nothing else, because it's a, it's a richly fertile exhibit. Uh, we'll, we'll hear more about that in a bit. Um, our first speaker is Marco Paletti. And uh, Marco um, has, has with, his, with his partner, uh, some really fantastic exhibits upstairs. And he's going to explain that and talk more broadly about his work. He's co-founder and director of Ecologic Studio which is an architectural and urban design practice specializing in environmental design, urban self-sufficiency, and building integrated nature. Um, experimenting with biomaterials, some of which you can see upstairs, uh, has created the world's first living edible architecture. Uh, so rather than me going to read out his CV, I think, given the time, it's best if Marco comes up and explains what's on the slide uh, and many other things to do with his work. So Marco, please. <laughs> There you go. Okay, perfect. So thanks for having me and thanks for uh, exhibiting our work upstairs uh, in this very intriguing exhibition. I think uh, what uh, excited me uh, at first is the, the, the topic, of course, uh, materials, but uh, there is a, a particular twist and uh, I hope I can offer a little bit of a uh, uh, more specific insight in the way we like to understand uh, materials or I should say materiality uh, in, a, in a more speculative uh, fashion. Some people call me the algae man and I'm not necessarily one of the experts I think in, in algae per se but I think we've been working in the last eight years on a project which started a kind of research line and then developed into a series of prototypes and architectural uh, pavilions. Uh, which demonstrate the possibility to um, not only grow algae in an urban environment, but also to integrate them in a pretty profound way with the urban fabric or with the fabric of architecture, where we think uh, may uh, uh, produce the, the, the highest uh, uh, possible uh, benefit. Um, this is uh, one of the projects uh, uh, and one of the prototypes uh, which was first exhibited in Milan, uh, Milano became an interesting point for us because we were involved in the expo uh, uh, two years ago, uh, which was a big event and offered us a platform to really present uh, this idea to, to the world, I would say. But in a way, the, 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 the concept started uh, very locally and, and, and especially in the fact that Milano, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, 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 let's say, traditionally connected by a series of canals and waterways which were built, in fact, uh, at the time of Leonardo da Vinci. And uh, they, uh, uh, today, have been, uh, uh, let's say, abandoned, although I should say recently uh, they are coming back as a sort of leisure way, a bit like uh, it is happening in London. But they naturally host a, a, a kind of diversity of microorganisms. And, and interestingly enough, uh, um, nobody really knows. Or if you want, uh, this type of ecosystem escapes uh, a typical categorization. They're not part of any plan or master plan as such. Not even landscape architect normally deals with microorganisms as such, although some do, I have to say. Um, but we thought we may uh, um, exploit this, uh, this, uh, this uh, found uh, ecosystem and, and kind of give them a new, a new host. And we worked on the project for quite a while, and, and, and we, we came to this uh, uh, interesting uh, possibility, which was to uh, utilize a material system that is, uh, uh, let's say, uh, known in architecture, which is this ETFE cladding, but uh, develop a new prototypes whereby the membrane, the space in between two sheets of ETFE, which normally is filled with air, uh, would become, in fact, uh, a kind of uh, space for this uh, culture to, to thrive. Therefore, the cushion would become a photobioreactor, as uh, it is uh, called. 
and here is a microscopic picture of the creatures uh, uh, inside of the microbioreactor. And this is the, the way we articulate uh, the, the system in the pavilion we presented in Expo. Uh, it's, uh, the, the reason why I, I'm, I'm showing you the, this image, uh, which in a way is kind of contrasting with the materiality, it's a very abstract picture, but I think something that is quite important in our work is this idea of uh, um, materiality as a combination of matter and, and, and the sort of uh, a system that delivers it. And so in a way, it's a kind of a meshed uh, product of how energy, matter and information exchange. I will talk about that more in detail later. This is uh, the view from beneath the canopy, which would obviously operate as a kind of screening device, modulating the microclimate and at the same time uh, growing uh, uh, biomass within it. This is a view in the future food district. Within the pavilion in this occasion we, we grew spirulina, which is a uh, considered by many a food of the future. So uh, eventually this was really about understanding how uh, uh, urban agriculture may be understood uh, in a sort of a, a future uh, technological way. Uh, this is a little video uh, that I will uh, show uh, um, uh, briefly. So. You get a sense of the dynamic effects and the scales from the actual particle or cell to the city. So this gives you an idea of, of the, 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 the broader scope of the project. The project then has evolved also in different uh, instances and we have developed a series of artworks uh, that explores not only the, the, the sort of a material as, as a kind of a properties, but also the relationship between uh, matter and form and morphology. And, and so in this case, energy is not just what you can uh, collect uh, when you harvest the algae, but it's really this uh, uh, complex relationship between uh, light and the energy that comes from the sun as it eats these uh, microorganisms and the way they are articulating space. And this is some of the artwork we have produced uh, to, to explore that. 
Um, but let's say if on one side this project uh, has uh, now entered uh, a phase uh, of development uh, and, and is being taken forward by the practice ecologic studio, at the same time there are a series of other uh, experiments that we have uh, conducted and mainly within the, the framework of the urban morphogenesis lab uh, here in UCL, uh, which is directed by my partner uh, Claudia Pasquero. Biocement is one of those uh, of those lines, and uh, and really uh, came as a, as a kind of consequence, if you want, of uh, uh, this idea of um, of, of um, using algae, embedding algae in the materiality. And and you know, in the in the prototype you saw, obviously the ETFE and the algae themselves <laughs> are are a part of a whole, but at the same time, materially they are quite segregated. So this project of Biocement is looking at what happens when algae are made to react biochemically uh, with uh, with uh, with uh, uh, other material, in this case sand, and, and act as binders. And obviously, uh, the idea was also to exploit innovations uh, like uh, 3D printing, large scale 3D printing, so to bring this idea on site. And uh, this project uh, started uh, uh, as a conversation with Enrico Dini, which is, uh, uh, which is the author of this uh, uh, large machine. And uh, initially, it was uh, tested as a, as a kind of process uh, with uh, artificial binder. But then later on, uh, through this project, uh, uh, it became uh, really a, a, a question of how we can understand uh, 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 this uh, uh, biotechnological project as a part of a, of, a larger, of a larger landscape. So algae in this particular instance uh, are not uh, anymore growing within uh, uh, ETFE bioreactor, but they really become uh, uh, part of a, of a kind of um, composite material uh, of uh, what we call biodigital material. Uh, the video uh, is, uh, is uh, showing the, the way the project has been uh, uh, conducted, the research has been conducted. You will see that obviously at this stage is uh, still highly speculative, but uh, it really tries to uh, um, develop materiality as a combination of uh, uh, forces that are on site, that are harvested on site, like the, the power of the wind and the uh, presence of these microorganisms on site and the ability that we have through digital technology to uh, 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 shape these processes or if you want uh, uh, induce uh, uh, particular patterns uh, within within this project. So, in that sense, you may begin to understand uh, 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 planning or or, or uh, um, the, the the kind of uh, uh, um, design of large scale landscape more as a sort of a extended gardening process uh, rather than a kind of traditional uh, idea of uh, of construction. And uh, here you see um, speculative ideas uh, of. Uh, using drones and uh, other kind of devices uh, in the delivery of the bacteria, and in this case the, the cyanobacteria, uh, which are present in the, in the territory. To, to conclude, so I don't take too much time, uh, I, I want to mention this other uh, line of inquiry, which is started uh, two years ago uh, on bacterial cellulose. And uh, you see uh, some samples of this uh, uh, project uh, upstairs in the exhibition. There is, in fact, also a tank where you can see the bacterial cellulose growing. At the moment, you'll see the layer uh, floating. And, and uh, here you again will see the process uh, uh, taking place. Uh, what is interesting here is that uh, bacteria are used uh, uh, to um, basically um, process uh, waste, process organic waste. Uh, so the, the, the study starts at the urban scale again, a bit like with the, with the algae in, in Milano. In this case, we are looking at organic waste as a, as a raw material. And then you see here the process uh, uh, happens uh, in a more or less uh, a week or a week and a half. You begin to see the first layer uh, forming. So what bacteria do here really break down uh, the molecule of waste and uh, creates uh, these small fibers of cellulose. In fact, uh, um, similar to, to, to what paper is made of, but in this case they are uh, synthesized by the organism themselves. And then they, they uh, accumulate and create these uh, uh, sheets which we then harvest and dry. And the drying process is very interesting because in the moment you dry, uh, uh, it, the material shrinks. And uh, the shrinking can be exploited to give the material a certain strength or a certain structure. And uh, obviously we have played with both manual and robotic uh, technique to, to see and, and, and experiment ways of giving the structure a form. 
Uh, this is uh, one of the tests which uh, led to the prototype you see hanging upstairs, uh, which is basically, uh, it was made by uh, just simply allowing the material to dry and shrink over a formwork made of little recycled plastic cups. And so then uh, those are uh, removed and you, you are left with, uh, with this uh, kind of very thin and lightweight structure. And of course the project goes on speculating about this uh, as, a, as a form of, 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 of architecture, of larger scale architecture, but also if you want a way of thinking about um, uh, what we now consider uh, uh, waste has becoming a source of new raw material. So it's really about uh, uh, changing the metabolism of the city and creating a kind of new uh, uh, type of, uh, of, uh, of a flow of material within, within the urban environment. I think for tonight is okay and I hope uh, later we have a chance to have a little bit more of a conversation. If you have questions, I think we are going to, to answer them later. Okay, thanks a lot for your attention. Thank you very much, Marco. Um, terrific amount of information to digest, as it were, in that. And uh, hopefully you can store your question, write your question, we'll get to it. But uh, next up is Richard. Richard uh, Beckett, Director of Biota Lab at the Bartlett, which is a design research lab exploring new modes of simulation and production in architecture, as well as advances in the field of synthetic biology, biotechnology, molecular engineering, and material sciences. Richard's an architect and designer who's an interesting background because he studied physiology and biochemistry before working in research and development for GlaxoSmithKline as a physical properties scientist uh, and then moved into architecture, worked for Lifshitz, Dan Davison, Sandlands, amongst others, uh, before setting up his own practice and now um, heading up this unit at, uh, at the Bartlett. Um, so over to you, Richard. Thank you. Thank you very much. on um, something we're calling bioreceptive design. And this is going to um, cover two areas that we're working on. I'm going to keep saying we because um, Biota Lab is, is, a, is a, um, a master's unit at the Bartlett School of Architecture, but obviously it's not, not just run by myself. There's my colleague Marcus Cruz, and there's also a wider group of us that are working on, on an EPSRC-funded project. So today I'm going to show you um, some information on, on the research project, and then there will also be some of the student work as well. And I mean, great, great to hear Marco talking about that because we're, we're addressing a lot of the similar issues, but of, of course in, in different ways within, within the unit. Um, I mean, the conversation of, of a nature integrated architecture um, gives itself to a, to a context of urban greening. I mean, urban greening has been a strategy that's, that's, that's come from, from many areas, from the sort of dirty industrial past. It's now seen as a as a way of, uh, as an antidote to our illness of our cities right it's a healthy healthy phenomenon it's it, it's it's global now it's it's everywhere and just to sort of show you a few of the the ways this is being approached i mean the, the top left image is the the notion of introducing parks and gardens which which came from you know pr probably the the 19th, 18th century at that point but then the, the idea that we can green buildings that we can use the the roofs and the the vertical surfaces of our building as a greening strategy has become something that's popular too and so green walls and vegetative walls again, are now seen pretty much everywhere around the world. Um, the, one, the one in the middle at the bottom is, is the BIQ, the Algae House in, in Hamburg. And you know, this, this was one of the first ones that really took this more slightly technological angle to, to greening our buildings. Um, and follows very much on from, from the conversations that you've just heard about growing microalgae in, in bioreactors on, on the facades of our buildings. Um, and then the one at the top right is the kind of the, the, the the biophilic version of greening our cities now, where, where nature is completely integrated into our cities. You, you know, you don't even really see the buildings anymore. Um, and we're completely supportive of all of those. Um, but we are trying something different. Um, and we're moving away from the notion of containment and liquid cultures to grow these, these species. And the, the bottom right image is, is, a, is a tree bark. Um, and we're interested in exploring architecture that moves away from the idea of an architecture having a skin, which is a, you know, it's a very common metaphor. We always talk about buildings having skins. Well, we're, we're talking about buildings having being a metaphor as a tree bark. And so it's protective, but it's also a host. It's a host for the growth of other things. And this is, um, yeah, this, this is three pictures of, of the same tree. This is down in Kew Wakehurst, down at, down at the seed bank down there. And it's, it's a kind of 360 panorama of, of the tree bark. Um, and so the, the clearest thing is, is that you, 
don't get continuous growth in this 360 degree circle because it's so inherently driven by environmental conditions and other things as well. We'll talk about those. But you can see the, the big kind of band of mosses that are growing down the middle, the big green bit. As you move out, you tend to get some of the slightly more lichen-y species, the dust lichens and things like that. And then there's patterns of algae growing. And so this, this orientation, this environmental condition is, is a driver for this growth. But of course also so the materiality, the, the tree bark itself has a materiality. It's a, it's a word we, we use a lot. But it has chemical conditions, it has pH values, it has organic nutrients in there. Um, and of course, also, this, this is a changing condition. Green doesn't happen, certainly in this climate, it doesn't happen all year. And the three pictures, one is October, one is February, I think one is May. You can see how certain species thrive at different times of the year. And I think it's an acceptance of this natural condition of, of nature. Rather than the green walls, which aim to be green the whole year round, it's, it's, nature doesn't really work like that. And obviously, to design for that requires a lot of energy in order to achieve that. The problems come is if the energy going into that year-round growth fails, you get failure in the growth, and that, then that becomes a problem. It's a problem for the client, it doesn't look very nice, and obviously it costs money to keep doing that. And so we're exploring growth, nature integrated growth in architecture through this principle of bioreceptivity, and bioreceptivity was a term uh, coined by Guillet in 1995, and it's, I'll read it to you, it's the aptitude of a material to be colonized by one or several groups of li living organisms without necessarily undergoing any biodeterioration. Oh, these are a bit small, they look big when I do them. Um, but we're taking the, these principles of, of the left cluster here of growth in nature. So this surface growth where the material itself is a host for this growth that we also see on buildings. This happens everywhere and most people spend a lot of money actually to try and clean this off buildings. So there's a lot of products and there's a lot of uh, processes to remove these lichens and algae stains um, on buildings. The, I'll talk about the aesthetics in a minute, but just, just quickly on the background, the, the two images just, just that you see there are two projects that um, were done by Marcus and Marin Architects. I was working with them as part of Biota Lab. And the first one in the middle is, is what we called Algazebo, and you can't really see it in this picture, it's not the best picture, but the two thin columns had sort of contain algae containers growing in there, and this was, this was the first experiment to try and incorporate algae in, in, into architecture for us. The one on the end is a, is a project that's at the FRAC, it was for the um, for an exhibition there in, in Orléans in France and this was the first step for us of moving away from containers and trying to grow microorganisms on the surface of the material itself. In the end it became an indoor project and you know it couldn't be done like that but the idea those, those central parts you see in each of the geometries was an idea that we could seed certain areas of the material with species and over time that would naturally proliferate and grow around. And so this brings us into to, to the, the main context of our research we're going to talk about. And just, just to give you a sense and, and an idea, cryptogamic covers is talking about algae, lichens, and mosses, really. I, mean, I think it covers a few other things as well. Um, but as I say, this happens everywhere. Um, and interestingly, it's, it's what it grows on that tends to determine whether it looks nice. Um, and, and the reason I'll talk about a bit more about aesthetics in, 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 the, in the future is that, that to try and control nature is one thing, but ultimately it will be driven by its own set of conditions. Um, and obviously, just to give a quick background, you know, nature in architecture has, has been done a lot. So in the, in the Romanticism period, it was depicted in paintings as a kind of romantic, nostalgic kind of thing. It's been uh, integrated as natural ele elements as decoration. Um, the one on the top right is... Um, the kind of the, the way it was done in, in modernism where nature was part of the city but it was to look at it wasn't really integrated with the buildings themselves and of course nature in architecture has been done biomimetically as well um, st both structurally and uh, form wise so it fits into this as a, as a context but what we call in pure aesthetics what we're noticing is when you get this cryptogamic growth on buildings it doesn't look nice on modernist buildings it doesn't look white right on flat white surfaces um, and that's the one that most, most people try to clean off. Um, and it's to, do with, um, well, it's to do with many things. I mean, people can talk about it as a, as a dirt. People associate it as dirty, which, again, when you're talking about modernism, you know, the notion of cleanliness in modernism was such a, a kind of driver at the, at the time um, with the hygiene revolution and all these other things. Um, yet when you see it on statues and older buildings, it, it tends to look nice, I think. I think it does. Um, but it's about... It's about there's, a, there's an underlying geometry here which when it becomes recognisable and figural, perhaps, um, this kind of growth almost tends to look designed. 
as opposed to on blank surfaces when it looks very patchy. People tend to, I think, associate it with a pathology and kind of skin skin rashes and things like that. So for, for us, there's a, there's a technical challenge of integrating the material, but it also has a huge aesthetic agenda too, right? Because this has to be something that people would like on their buildings. And so bioreceptive design in the research project, we, we're working on this in, in many levels. So we have developed or actually a, a biologist in UPC in Barcelona named Sandra Manso, who's working with us. She, she actually, as part of her PhD, developed a type of concrete um, that could grow uh, cryptogamic covers on it. And so traditional concrete has a very high pH usually, which I think over the course of probably 50 to 80 years tends to drop down a bit, and that's when you see a bit of growth happening on the older buildings. But by developing a type of concrete that has a more neutral pH, has physical properties of porosity, uh, moisture absorption, we can actually achieve this growth on it. And so we're jumping in more at the medium scale here, which is taking the material and developing it up to a, to a medium scale towards the notion of facade panels. And obviously, of course, we are interested as well in scaling that up properly to buildings. And our uh, industrial partner on the project is Lango Rock, and we're at that stage in the project now where we're hoping to kind of scale this up properly. Um, I mean, I'll probably skip through this. Uh, the observational studies for us have been key. Um, although we're funded by the, the Sciences Council and there's an awful lot of scientific research going on, natural observations and seeing how these things grow, where they grow, the type of conditions they grow on, has, has been crucial for us to understand. Um, and may, maybe I'll go through these ones quickly as well because they're not particularly exciting, but it's about designing the material properties itself. Um, so what kind of binders we're using, what kind of aggregate size we're using is important for the pore size, uh, the cement ratio and the amount of cement paste. Of course, is all important in order to create this concrete which is deemed as bioreceptive. Let's skip through these. And so this, this panel on the right-hand side is, is our, was our first kind of precedent to do this. And what you can see is three layers. So there's actually an OPC front layer, which is Portland cement. There's a middle layer of our bioreceptive cement, and then a back layer again, which was a structural layer. But the idea was that we could create particular areas where the growth would happen. So it's not happening as a complete covered green condition, but actually we might say that we want growth to happen in very particular areas which we can control through the materiality but also through the geometry of the panels which again follows the line of the aesthetics. So very much about delivering water to specific areas. This, this is using a front kind of surface based approach. Uh, that's a render on the right or a Photoshop on the right. Um, Oh, sorry, I'm going to go quickly because we're running a bit out of time, aren't we? But um, these are some of the facade panels that we've been working on at the minute. And we've tried a whole taxonomy of geometries, which is aimed at um, enhancing the growth in certain areas and uh, inhibiting it, let's, let's say, in others. So this geometry has a, a kind of pocket agenda. So it's about trapping uh, rainwater into pockets and then letting that kind of disperse through the panel. There's a more vertical um, kind of agenda, which is much more about channeling rainwater on the front surface. And then we have a more the one on the left-hand side there, which we call the Baroque geometry. Um, has these kind of catch, and we call it catchability, but they has these kind of areas that catch water. So it's all about really catching as much water as you can from natural rain events, because we're trying to do this as a more passive notion without the need to mechanically irrigate this, which adds in an awful lot of energy and an awful lot of cost. So we are very much relying on designing for natural conditions. And so this is a, a 12 month uh, observational study we're doing. This is a north-ish facing um, orientation. You can see white panels and you can see kind of brown panels. The white ones are Portland cement controls and then the brown ones are three of each of the three geometries. And so these have been up now for about 10 months and they're there for another kind of five or six months. And there's an awful lot of observation and, and measuring. We've got some sensors in there so we know what's happening to the moisture. Um, and we're doing surveys to, to measure the amount of growth. Um, I've talked very quickly then, finishing off, is that we're exploring this as a wider condition within the unit, um, and some of the students' work is exploring the notion of bioreceptivity through computational methods, but also through materiality. And you can see some of these materials upstairs. And so the one on the right there is, obviously you can see the, the designed areas where we wanted the, the microalgae to grow, just in between those crevices, and then the central areas where we really wanted the, the bryophytes, the mosses, to grow. Um, this is exploring the notion of a, of a component rather than necessarily a facade panel, which, which brings with it um, different, different things. And we don't necessarily, is this one going to play? We don't necessarily always look at um, cryptogams. We're interested in other materials as well. Uh, obviously very interested in digital fabrication and, and exploring what, what these new methods of fabrication can give us differently from traditional methods. This was a screen system designed. Uh, slow video, let me just skip on. Oh, I can't skip it, sorry. 
Um, anyway, this was designed actually to uh, yeah, grow mycelium, so these kind of central areas where you could have these scaffolds for growth, where you can design an architectural scaffold. The materials and the species could be seeded into these scaffolds, and they tend to grow and proliferate um, on the material itself. And of course, there's a range of design applications <coughs> uh, on the small scale as, as facades, as, as pavilions, um, and we now have a couple of projects with TfL where we're going to be able to actually fabricate some of these things properly and, and really try them out as, as a proper two-year study. Um, yeah, I think, I think that's it. But again, yeah, the questions at the end, and if anybody has any, any thoughts, do let me know. Thank you. You made a couple of those panels, or copies of those panels, are upstairs, along with um, the mosses. Um, but the mosses were beautiful when they arrived, when Richard and his colleague gave them to us. And we haven't been looking after them to the best effect under the air conditioning upstairs, but you can see what's left of them. Uh, and they were beautiful, <laughs> I can tell you. Um, and we'll, we'll, try and, we'll try and restore them to health with a, with a bit of rainwater, maybe. Now, next up, um, uh, Simone Ferracina, who is a researcher at the School of Architecture, Planning and Landscape at Newcastle University, uh, formerly Associate and Project Director at Richard Meyer and Partners in, in New York. Um, Simone drew the concept brick designs for this collaborative uh, project called uh, Living Brick, which we have an example of upstairs, and you can go and look at afterwards. And, and he's part one of a sort of two header because it's a joint project done with um, University of West of England, mm -hmm. from which Jimmy will speak. Uh, the Living Brick is a modular structure that houses microbial fuel cells, which are bioelectrochemical devices, living batteries, uh, converting the chemical energy of organic matter into electricity. And rather than me reading on, I think I should hand over straight away. Simone can explain it in some expertise. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Um, so my name is Simone Ferracina, and I'm a researcher in the Living Architecture Project at the um, School of Architecture, Planning, and Landscape at Newcastle University, uh, where I work with the project coordinator, Rachel Armstrong. Um, today I will introduce a little bit the, the, the basic ideas behind the Living Architecture Project, and then... Um, uh, our colleague from the University of West England will go into more detail of some of the technologies involved. It is a collaborative project with a lot of people involved, um, and it is an EU Horizon 2020 Open Future uh, Emerging Technology funded project. Um, so it is a collaboration between Newcastle University, the University of the West of England, the Consejo Nacional de Investigaciones Científicas in Madrid, the University of Trento and Explora Biotech in Italy, and Liquifer Systems Group in Austria. The project aims to design and build a structural bioreactor wall made of modular living bricks. But what is a living brick and what is a bioreactor wall? They are programmable ecosystems um, that go beyond the representation of nature in architecture and rather directly incorporate living systems into materials, technologies and methods for the choreography of space. So there are structural systems as much as bodies with metabolisms. And this uh, will look familiar now, but um, if we interrogate the Stones of Venice, for instance, in Italy, we find that the convergence between traditional building materials such as fired clay bricks and natural organisms is already well underway and active in generating life-promoting infrastructures. On the shores of the cities uh, where we found these bricks, uh, we can find bricks colonized by biofilm and seaweed, barnacles biocemented um, to stone, calcareous accretions made by tube worms, murano glass sintered to mixtures of rock and algae. So similarly, we strive to develop building infrastructures that work in sophisticated ways with living and lifelike systems, and do so in a contextual way. Design some components that contribute positively to the complex system of ecological networks in which a building is situated. So the project doesn't want to produce one perfect prototype of the living brick um, or bioreactor wall but rather uh, suggest a general set of technological and architectural recipes that can then be contextually adapted and retuned. 
So we're looking at a wide range of possible applications from very uh, urbanized locations to uh, rural communities in Senegal with hugely different sets of requirements and needs. We will now review uh, the, the basic aims and uh, principles of this recipe, which is based on the operational principles of microbial communities. So again, to this question, what is a living brick? It is a modular architectural bioreactor that is populated by a programmable microagriculture, which can deliver specific biochemical products, so biomass, fertilizer, polished wastewater and functions uh, such as generating oxygen, generating electrical power, and extracting valuable resources from light. So this is um, one of the first prototypes developed in the project by our partners at the Bristol Bioenergy Center. And you can see a very similar prototype upstairs, uh, see and smell. Um, uh, which combines a simple fundamental unit of construction, the brick, that we all know, uh, that we use in the construction of buildings, with a microbial fuel cell. Um, the microbial fuel cell, or MFC, which Jimmy will speak about more in detail, um, is an electrochemical device whereby bacteria generate electricity through oxidation of organic wastes and renewable biomass. The chemical energy of organic feedstock is converted into electricity via the metabolic processes of microorganisms, which act as biocatalysts. So in a way, it is a kind of wet battery. A uh, microbial fuel cell consists of two compartments, the anode and the cathode, separated by a proton exchange membrane. In the anode chamber, bacteria anaerobically oxidize organic substrates or fuel, generating electrons and releasing protons. The electrons travel via an external circuit, and the protons flow through the membrane to recombine at a cathode and react with oxygen to produce water. What you see represented in this uh, diagram with the algae is a further step from the prototype shown upstairs today. Because the cathode doubles up as a photobioreactor. Uh, in other words, the cathodic environment of the MFC is used to cultivate phototrophic microorganisms such as algae that photosynthesize and produce oxygen as a byproduct. So this is not what it looks like. And finally, a defining ambition of the Living Architecture Project, aside from these two bioreactors we talked about, the microbial fuel cell and the photobioreactor, is to add a third, which is the Synthetic Microbial Consortium, uh, which expands the scope and functionalities of the microbial fuel cell uh, through designed microbial communities that perform a la carte functions. So that's what we call um, a metabolic app. The project envisages two separate SMC modules, a farm module exposed to the facade and a labor module placed on the interior side of the building envelope. The farm module will supply easily metabolized carbon as energy source for the carbon module, while the labor module will perform the target biotechnological functions that we assign them. Stability is achieved through metabolic cross-feeding. So where one organism synthesizes a compound that the other needs and cannot produce. So other components of the SMC can be equipped with synthetic genetic elements, biobricks, designed for different functionalities, such as cleaning gray water or polluted air, or removing phosphates and nitrogen oxides. And that could be used for uh, the production of biodetergents, for instance. So the living wall reinvents the idea of the boundary, not as a way to separate ourselves from the environment, but to process and encounter it. The outputs of such bioreactor walls could include polished water, fertilizer, recoverable uh, biomass, oxygen, and electrical power, which is something, again, you can see upstairs with the thermometers. As mentioned earlier, living spaces thus become programmable ecosystems which can be customized to suit the available resources and needs of a community. And we'll be testing this technology in different contexts, working, for example, with the climate challenges faced by the city of Venice and the energy and clean water needs of rural Senegal. 
the understanding of sustainability, therefore, goes here beyond resource conservation and towards the incorporation of metabolic design and community into living spaces, moving from inert materials with low toxicity values to ecologically productive uh, building components and surfaces. Furthermore, the, the burning of fossil fuels is substituted here by a wet burning of microorganisms and metabolisms. Um, I will lastly share, uh, I'm gonna skip this, um, three drawings that begin to describe how the project's impacts go beyond the living brick itself as an output and reach further into questions of design methodology, interdisciplinarity, and ethics. The architectural drawing is typically a tool employed by designers to convey an intent or to issue a command. But in this project, things are a bit differently. The drawing doesn't try to think through solutions, but rather to generate and pursue questions. It is a conversation piece. In this case, for example, the drawing interrogates the membrane between uh, the two chambers that make up a uh, microbial fuel cell, the anode and the cathode, and how changes in porosity, materiality, shape, uh, intensity could affect the exchange of protons. Are different intensities along the membrane something to pursue? Um, is optimiza optimization likely to increase or decrease if the membrane and the, the surface between the two chambers is increased. As architects and designers, we interrogate the technologies developed by our scientific partners, as well as our disciplinary knowledge in terms of construction, modularity, wall assemblages, materials, etc. We do so in a very spatial and architectural way. Um, here, for instance, we begin to draw possible spatial configurations between the two chambers. Um, but also to uh, draw a brick that because it includes a photobioreactor, it is an oriented brick. So it's no longer a dull unit of construction uh, with, with no agency, but it starts, uh, it, it's no longer inert, but it's alive, but also situated and engaged in its environment. And finally here, uh, we start to collide all these different types of bioreactors into possible designs and ideas for a structure of chassis and, um, and wall systems. And to account for things um, such as maintenance um, of, of these systems. And yet the, w what is striking here is that these designs or th these proposals and fragments don't propose um, answers. The fragments identified in the drawings represent questions and set of possibilities that necessarily must become prototypes and be taken back into the space of the laboratory. And this is why I mentioned ethics. The project begs a relinquishing of control and the admission that these complex living systems must be co-designed with other agencies, disciplinary and non-disciplinary, human and non-human, alive and inert. Thank you. We're touching on some big, uh, big, big questions there, I think. Um, but uh, I do want to kind of bring it back to, back to the bricks, in fact, um, with Jimmy is going to talk. Uh, Jimmy uh, Rimbu is going to research associate from Bristol Bioenergy Centre at University of Western England. We'll talk particularly about the project um, that, that is upstairs. Jimmy studies microbial fuel cells. And uh, yeah, he's talking about particularly about how this project upstairs uh, turns, turns that activity into energy, which clearly is very useful. Um, so, Jimmy, please, yeah, are you ready to go? Hello, my name is Jimmy, and uh, I'm a scientist at the University of the West of England for the moment. And 
Right, yeah, because I just joined the, this university last year and uh, I came from Romania, I'm Romanian. So, and uh, I spent um, about 20 years in Romania doing research. So my background is in chemical engineering, but in Romania I work in the electrical engineering institute. So I try to, all this year to combine, years to combine chemical engineering with electrical engineering. And now I use the experience, uh, the, um, this experience, gain experience and combine with biology. Now, uh, today I try to convince you <laughs> that the microbes could be our friends, not only our enemies, and uh, they could help us to improve our lives. But still we need to wash our hands before getting, <laughs> getting food. Yeah, and uh, we actually in our project, uh, my colleague uh, Simone uh, explained to you what we are looking for. And uh, as a basic, we try to, to exploit some uh, um, uh, biological processes and to exploit to, uh, those processes to extract more than we use. Here in the next, slides, uh, next slide, you have some uh, biochemical processes, I'm sure you already know many of them. And uh, for example, fermentation, yeah. I can say our Romanian, uh, we Romanian are, are very, uh, we are very talented to uh, biochemistry, especially in uh, fermentation. We used to, to prepare in Romania very good brandy, from brandy. So, <laughs> so just uh, after Brexit, if your prime minister if push Romanian out, you lose here uh, very good, uh, how to say, expertise. <laughs> yes. Now, but uh, as you can see, you can. Uh, there are different processes uh, starting from photosynthesis. You know, and uh, you already. Uh, I'm sure you know about aerobic and anaerobic respiration and uh, gasification, combustion, pyrolysis. But today I will stop only uh, on microbial fuel cells because it's a bit special. And um, uh, now what uh, my colleague explained you, what is a microbial fuel cell actually is a uh, bioelectrochemical system which is used to transform direct the, um, how to say it, the chemical energy into electricity. So in, inside of a microbial fuel cell, yeah, the organic matter is oxidized and could be transformed direct in, into electricity. Yeah, you can see uh, in the right side, yeah, the, you can see um, normal principles how the organic matter is converted to different uh, byproducts, how organic matter is uh, uh, the molecules of organic matter, uh, they are broken in uh, small molecule sugars and converted further in uh, CO2, yeah? Uh, but uh, looking inside of a microbial fuel cell, this is the reaction, chemical reaction, is just an explanation of, uh, um, uh, yeah, how, uh, like um, glucose molecule, how is broken, uh, how is converted direct under uh, the microbes using microbes uh, as catalysts? Yeah, so it's converted in uh, CO two, and but uh, also in um, hydrogen. You can uh, protons and electrons. Uh, like uh, microbial fuel cells look like uh, in this uh, diagram, and uh, you we have two electrodes, like in a normal battery, in a membrane between. And uh, in the anode side, yeah, uh, the organic matter is oxidized and uh, by the microorganism and the microorganism they produce electrons which are transferred yeah, to the second electrode, to the cathode. Through the membrane of the system, the, um, anion, uh, the ions, yeah, hydrogen uh, proton is transferred. So in the other one side, to the cathode side, yeah, actually uh, happened the uh, oxygen reduction reaction where oxygen is reduced to water. Yeah. And uh, this is the principle of uh, getting electricity. 
and exploiting the electricity. We use in this system, we can use uh, wastewater. This is um, like, um, uh, how to say, uh, an image from microscopy, yeah, fluorescence image on wastewater. You can see different bacteria, yeah. dirty, dirty water. And, uh, but because uh, we s I said that I will focus on microbial fuel cell, in uh, our system, in the microbial fuel cell, uh, we can use uh, uh, urine or wastewater yeah, coming from the farm. Or we now we focus how to implement this system, microbial fuel cell, in our houses, in, in the civil architecture. So having this system in a civil, uh, civil architecture, in the houses, in the buildings, we try to exploit the human rest, yeah? the human uh, waste, yeah? like urine and the waste from the toilet, and, how and to convert this into electricity. And uh, using a microbial fuel cell system, actually we uh, use in for different uh, reason for different application like mm, uh, water cleaning, yeah, or as I said to you to to produce power or to produce uh, special valuable products like catalyte or or we can use such systems in pathogen killing. So from this uh, kind of work can be uh, which can be done uh, using, exploiting this technology, uh, could be some derived applications. You can see microbial fuel cell technology in different applications, like in lighting, charging, yeah, different applications re uh, regarding the, you know, I told the electrical engineering, in, in application regarding disinfection, water recycling, fertilizers, producing fertilizers, and uh, sanitation, and even in Autonomous robots. Yeah. yeah okay. And um, this was just a small preview about microbial fuel cell and what they can do. Now I try to show you what we've done at the University of the West of England. Okay. This is how looks uh, an anode colonized. Yeah. An electrode colonized by bacteria. Uh, by bacteria. Yeah. Because. Uh, before starting to produce power, the electrode should be colonized by bacteria to get a bacterial community, which this community will work further on the organic matter. Uh, I use different materials, carbon materials, and uh, the colony of uh, bacteria look different on, the, on different uh, uh, substrate, carbonic substrates. And, uh, that is a SEM uh, scanning electron microscopy image yeah, on a bacterial film. Now, uh, at uh, University of the West of England, uh, Bristol Bioenergy, uh, Bioenergy Center, uh, my colleagues they focused, starting to work, uh, started to work uh, about uh, more than 15 years ago on uh, microbial fuel cells. And uh, because this group was um, implemented uh, into a robotics laboratory, they tried to combine uh, biology, bioelectrochemistry, and uh, uh, robots, yeah? how to use this in robots. So by 2003, uh, my colleagues, they uh, developed okay, the first project, EcoBot project using uh, microbial fuel cells, but this kind of fuel cells, they use actually monoculture, like E. coli at that time, and use chemicals to feed the E. coli, those monocultures. So later, by 2005, they tried to improve the system and to use wastewater, so multi-microbial cultures, which exist in the wastewater. So this was the second prototype. And uh, the third prototype is EcoBot 3 by 2010, uh, where this kind of robot, let's say, was able to move, yeah, it was thought, and to be able to move into the field and to get uh, feed, uh, to get feeded by 
itself. Yeah. So it's uh, this con uh, this system contains also like um, uh, stomach synthetic stomach, and uh, my colleagues uh, it used to be fed it with uh, different um, insects also. Yeah. and uh, having uh, uh, okay and having developing enough power to to move around, and later they developed uh, also about the fourth system. And another uh, system, uh, like uh, based on microbial fuel cell, they uh, was like a robot, yeah, using microbial fuel cell, inspired by the nature, yeah, inspired by water, bottom and insects. This is uh, kind of uh, developments we uh, had in uh, robotics, but also we tried to prove some concepts, new concepts in uh, this field. So uh, my colleagues, they, um, because uh, until that moment, uh, between electrodes we need like a membrane, ion transfer membrane. Yeah, but uh, now my colleagues, uh, they try to prove that uh, can use cheaper materials. So they introduce the ceramics. Yeah, this is the second step in developing such kind of systems. So my colleagues, they use ceramics. And um, also a second concept, uh, my colleagues, they try to prove that such system, systems, microbial fuel cells, could work with uh, urine. And uh, they manage, hopefully, to, to do this. And uh, this is uh, further development. So uh, we passed further from the laboratory scale to field trial, uh, uh, field trials. So you have here some uh, experiments we've done and we used to implement such systems during um, Glastonbury festivals in uh, Bristol we had in the last years. And also in, uh, in the courtyard of the uh, university. So we named this another type of toilet. Yeah. And uh, during the festival, we use, we change a bit the toilet and uh, equip the toilet with microbial fuel cells. So the people, we had a lot of uh, fuel, yeah, because the people consumed a lot of beer there. So it was not a problem. But um, uh, so if in the, this kind of toilet, outside <coughs> toilet at the university, we have five, 10 people users per day. But during the festivals, we had between 400, 800 users and or more than 1,000 users per day. So uh, we used to uh, to feed uh, the microbial fuel cell and to assure to the festival to assure the lighting system, yeah, overnight the, during the festivals. And uh, this is the uh, you will see upstairs, yeah, and my colleague already shown you. So we started uh, using our uh, expertise on uh, microbial fuel cell with uh, ceramics. So we try to get uh, different materials like uh, uh, on-shelf bricks. Yeah, these are on-shelf bricks you can buy. Yeah. And we transform them, uh, them in microbial fuel cell with the meaning on uh, yeah, later to transform our houses and to build e even a demonstrative house later. But also we've, uh, we are testing different ceramics we get from our partners, project partners, uh, because we try to, to improve, to work on materials, to, to get improvement in the uh, power output and, uh, on such system. So uh, this work is still uh, under, it's ongoing. And uh, this is what we're looking in the future, yeah, to, uh, yes, to implement such technology because we've seen it's possible to implement this technology in the, in ours in the civil uh, uh, architecture. Yeah, this is uh, yeah, Arup uh, from Hamburg is a kind of a demonstration building. From, yeah, this is. And uh, these are our partners and uh, our sponsors uh, we work with. Uh, 
in the last years. And uh, thank you very much for your presence. Uh, thank you, Jimmy. Thank you very much. Um, please, can all the speakers uh, move to the, the panel? We will have about 10 minutes of questions, and then we will go upstairs and be able to see the living brick uh, demonstration. Um, so if you want to sit down on the and um, I think I'll hand over to you to have some questions in a second. Uh, when, if you have a question, if I, if I identify your hand, please wait for the microphone to reach you because otherwise on the video it's absolutely hopeless and even in the room it's a bit hopeless. So please just wait for that microphone to be in your hand. Do say who you are if you want as well. Um, now that was really an incredibly packed and I'm sure a very abbreviated version of all your wonderful projects. Uh, so there's a lot going on in our heads, I think. But uh, let's see if we can try and bring some common themes out, some, some, uh, some if not conclusions, some directions. Um, so does anybody have a, a question to kick things off? Any hands going up? There's one hand here. Come on. Um, wonderful presentation. Thank you all. Um, just one question on the MFC. Um, what is the typical output of, um, let's say, a meter square south-facing brick using, you know, algo, human waste, like the minimum average and the maximum? And does the pH of the brick affect the output in any way, if it's a red or a black? Yeah, actually, I can say I don't know how um, which is the output on one square meter, but I can say uh, the output on one brick we, we have is uh, one, one, two milliwatt. Yeah, yeah. So the the output is not normal, it's not like a battery, but um, uh, this power is enough. In the you'll see upstairs, it's enough to two bricks, for example, to to power some LED systems. And uh, you'll see two bricks power uh, three electronic uh, devices, yeah, thermometer station. Um, okay, in my system, uh, you know, it's important for for the brick, yeah. Uh, also, to actually for the not only for the ceramic system to have a control porosity, and uh, because as you've seen in the system, the uh, ions are transferred through the membrane. Yeah, we'll see the the layer between the electrodes. So you need a control porosity there, and uh, no, but uh, what I can say uh, because you ask about the pH of the brick is. Uh, okay, it's not the pH of the brick because the, is uh, but the pH of the uh, analyte would influence the, yeah of the wastewater would influence the, the power output yeah not uh, of the material of the brick. Yeah. Is there a question here? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, this one's for Richard. Um, you're looking at these panels that you're applying to um, new builds. Um, considering most of our building stock is already constructed, have you considered or thought about the potential for retrofitting uh, bioreceptivity onto existing building stock? Um, and have you had any thoughts about how that might be done and what challenges that might pose? Yeah, we absolutely have. I mean, I, d I don't know if I sort of said it was necessary for new builds. No, we, we do see it absolutely as retrofits as well. Um, primarily because there's just huge amounts of blank walls that are <laughs> around our cities that uh, are not really doing anything. So definitely, in terms of the, the realities of doing that and the technicalities of doing that, I, I don't know, not, not so much. I mean, the, we've tended to focus purely at the moment on the material kind of development and the, the aesthetic design of these things and in order to achieve growth, and that was the kind of the main drive of the research project. Um, conversation about relying purely on rainwater events to achieve a lot of growth let's say because the question people always ask is how much growth do you get well it was never designed to have full coverage of growth that was what we kind of we, we said from the start but you, you actually it seems you actually don't get that much from rainfall events and so there does need to be some level of water feeding which if it was to be retrofitted on a roof sorry on, a, on, a, on an existing building we could hopefully use some level of water collection on the roof to feed to feed over into it not to the level of pipes and irrigation systems but so it would ideally would need that the second thing is that 
because we're so inherently being driven by the environmental conditions, it doesn't work on every building. Um, it, it's about choosing somewhere, it, and so just to skip ahead of that, it, traditionally when we kind of would survey a building or do a, do a site analysis, we, we do it purely on sunlight and stuff like that. But I think we need to start considering for this kind of growth on a much more micro level that really gives us a set of environmental conditions to design for. So it certainly you would not probably not going to get huge amounts of moss growing somewhere that gets too much sun, right? So um, it's certainly not going to be applicable to every single building, but could surely be designed based on the environmental conditions of that site, I think. Just to follow up on that question, I think mosses are generally like cleaning, a uh, clean environment, is that? Clean? Clean environment, yeah, so. Um, I, I think it varies, to be honest. I mean, I think, I think our cities are getting cleaner, which is why we're seeing a lot of the lichens come back. Um, but you certainly get a lot of mosses growing in, in urban environments. I mean, we, we design this purely based on urban conditions. Um, so, like, is pollution a factor in the... I'm, I'm sure experiment? it is. I'm sure it is. Yeah, I mean, we, we, we are following the agenda that if you can get some of these cryptogams growing, they can absorb pollution or certainly particulate matter. And what we tend to see is that mosses and, and the smaller uh, species are better than that than the larger leafier plants. Um, but in terms of how much pollution would stop mosses growing, I'm, I'm not a moss expert. Yeah, uh, I'm sure it would stop some species growing, but if you look, if you look around, I mean, you tend to see it more on roofs and, fl and horizontal surfaces. But if you look around, there, there's loads growing. Yeah, but I think probably it would be helpful to find out, you know, at which level the pollution will stop them growing. But I, yeah, I mean, maybe one thing I should say is, is that going back to the, the question of doing a site analysis for how you might design this, is that you would look around that specific area and see what kind of species are growing there naturally. Mm. Rather than saying I want to grow a particular type of moss because that looks nice, well, it, uh, nature doesn't really work like that. It's about finding what already grows there first because it's already been selected for. It's already proved it's kind of strong enough to grow in those conditions. So it's not about selecting necessarily beautiful species and saying we're definitely going to grow those. But it might be a case of looking around, seeing what's there naturally, and then trying to encourage the growth of that. Yeah, but also if you know they can clean, help cleaning the environment, then I think you know it would be quite useful to find out what moths can tolerate certain pollution and absorb it. And you know, then in, in the urban environment, it could help mm -hmm. cleaning yep. the pollution. <laughs> Thanks very much. I, 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 everything was fascinating. Um, the only thing is, I, I, as architects uh, and, and engineers, I can understand why you're very quick to link the, the vegetation to aesthetics. Um, however, the challenge that we're faced with is all cities need more housing. Now, we can't have any more housing because more housing means more air pollution, and the roads are already polluted. So we're at a, at a very important time whereby development in all of our cities is going to come to a grinding halt because uh, legally you can stop the So the only thing out there that can clean the air is vegetation. That's it. And your work is really important. Yet when we do a, uh, an environmental impact assessment, we ignore all your work because there's no scientific proof. So I, I, I think, <laughs> well, you know, I'll die, but you've got some very serious work to do to prove to the environmental impact assessors that your work actually does work. And I don't think you need to do too much work. Once we all agree it works, th then we could talk about what it looks like. Um, I would also add the preservation is important. As much as trees have preservation orders to protect a tree, and we all understand why, and it's the oxygen it produces, do you think your lichens and should have preservation orders on buildings? I think it's a great point. Uh, to be honest, I haven't really, really thought that far, but it, it is a, it is a nice idea. And certainly, if you could, uh, yeah, if you could achieve achieve the growth of certain species, you you stand you stand a better chance of doing that, right? If if there's particular species that are, you know, going back to your question, really really providing a, a certain amount. But I mean, I, I don't necessarily fully agree with your comment about there the, the can't be more housing because it, the, I'm, I'm not a planner, but the some planners you speak to suggest there's, there's plenty of opportunity for more 
for more houses. I guess the point I'm, I'm making on that is, is I, I, I'm not convinced that any of these technologies will ever become everywhere in cities. I, I don't think it's I don't think it's feasible. It's about finding the niches where we can do these things. That's not particularly our work. I'm talking about the, the application of integrated greenery in, in all cases. Um, I think the conversation of pollution is especially important because health in urban environments is certainly becoming at the forefront of discussions now, which is probably going to start driving probably more of these policies than actually the, the notion of sustainability is. I, th I think individual health is, is going to become going to become the driver of this. And maybe that's then easy, going to be easier to affect to, to, to drive these policies and be able to measure rather than the, the, the carbon absorption or the, the, the particulate matter absorption. Because it doesn't exist in the literature. It doesn't exist per square metre value because this stuff is so variable. It can't, I don't think it can exist. So, yeah, I, I think that... Once I think we are going to see a shift towards public health, and when the, that comes, maybe that's something that can be more easily classified. Marco, I can bring you because you actually did have some data in your your urban algae folly yeah. and its its ability to. I mean, I think I'm, things. I'm particularly intrigued by the point Chris is making. I think, in a way, this is something we thought about quite deeply when we started this work with the, with the microalgae. And I think one of the points was precisely that, of course, greening cities seems to be a, a kind of a paradigm that everybody agrees on. But in fact, if you look at the way this is proposed, typically is through you know, covering buildings with um, large trees or flower or plants. And these are all macro, uh, let's say, organisms uh, which have a a certain performance in a way they have a certain ability to oxygenate to filter etc etc but in fact they are most of their mass it's made of non-photosynthetic non-performative elements which are necessary to support the living organisms and i think what we, f we found fascinating in microalgae is in fact is that their entire body is photosynthetic they are cells and in that sense they are so much more effective if you want, if you are able to obviously uh, devise systems to integrate them in the built environment, which is what we're trying to do. And, and, and that's some of the data you saw in the video uh, saying that uh, uh, you know, the, the little pavilion had uh, the oxygenating power of uh, equivalent 25 large trees are not, um, let's say, speculations. In fact, they are based on, on, on tests and, and they are based on the fact that uh, precisely uh, uh, on the fact that the entire body of the of the of the microorganism is uh, is photosynthetic. So I think for me these these visions, uh, which may sound futuristic, are not just necessarily uh, a question of uh, let's say trying to push to the next the next uh, uh, interesting solution, uh, but it's really a necessity if we want to kind of unlock uh, this uh, kind of balance between uh, what we produce as waste in the city and what in fact we can use as, as building material and I mean maybe the, the two videos I show after in the presentation were a bit quick and still experimenting in a way but I think one of the points that we were trying to make there and you will see in the in the material upstairs in the bacterial cellulose is really to try to to invert this uh, this, uh, this mechanism actually thinking about the city not something that you have to regreen uh, but something that is already rich of an of enormous variety of, of, of microorganisms and, 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 and biodiversity, which in part is also produced by us and our systems. And so it's about you know, finding ways to, to circulate that back. So perhaps buildings are going to be made from uh, uh, this uh, type of, uh, of, uh, of material or what we consider now waste. And, and in that sense, the new housing will not equate more pollution, but rather, you know, a way of, uh, of reusing what is already there. And I mean, obviously, to a certain extent, it you know, can be understood as a far-fetched far -fetched scenario, but, you know, some technologies are already happening, already there. They're not, they're not uh, um, impossible to deploy. They I think they just need to be understood from a different perspective, which is, I think, what the work of designer is also all about. And I mean, I'm a designer and probably I'm the least technical of, of all here, but I think there is a role in, in, in kind of opening up, uh, um, let's say, scenarios that really unlock, uh, you know, the way we think about, uh, uh, you know, what we may consider now waste or pollution, uh, which in fact may be uh, useful raw material for, for many of these organisms. And, and, and that's, I think, the interesting element for me in, in this uh, in these aspects. Sorry, I'm just going to have to come back. It, it hasn't answered the question. Sorry, I may have not made the question clear. Um, you will, you, you will object, sorry, 
people will be able to object to construction of, plant, uh, of housing because they have pollution of their roads that, 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 that increase pollution. So when you do a development, you do an environmental impact assessment. Part of that is the air quality assessment. Those assessors that assess your building cannot assess the benefits of your work at all because there's no scientific proof. So what I was saying was that it's not, it's a nice idea to have a green city, it's an absolute necessity to get planning consent because part of planning consent about air pollution is about what is your mitigation? What are you gonna do about it? Well, the only thing you've got is your work. There's nothing you can do about air pollution. I mean, okay, you can grow a couple of trees, but in reality, it's not gonna answer the question. You, and Marcus, you, you hit the nail on the head. You're dealing with a very thin veneer of a microscopic layer. Of course it's much more efficient than a tree. But there's no evidence, so I can make a planning application and secure planning on the basis that your work is accepted as mitigation for improving air quality. And that's the work that we need to do, I mean urgently, right now. I have one more question, probably then we should break off and let you engage with some of the things upstairs. to business as usual and so that this sort of there is starting to try to cost some of these things so you can say is there an air pollution benefit what is it to enable these innovations to be more widely uh, uh, taken up um, but my question for you is that I know I'm in the building center and uh, everything that's been talked about tonight apart from the first speaker has really been about on buildings but there's a whole bunch of other urban fabric that is more horizontal that may be more, more conducive to moss for example that is in the built environment and how much of this is transferable to those other gray assets that so it's not just about the buildings um, and it's about transforming the rest of our infrastructure that green infrastructure policy currently ignores Gosh, that's Richard, that's for you. That's me. Yeah. I, I couldn't hear all of it. Were you asking about the, the potential for using other parts of the urban fabric? Rather yeah, than so just it's just the, the emphasis on buildings rather than on the, a whole host of other grey assets that need to remain grey for their primary function but could be green. Yeah, I mean, I, I completely agree. Yeah, it's just <laughs> we're kind of architects and I just we, we tend to just go straight for the buildings, right? Of course, I mean, every, everybody we speak to r r relating specifically to our work always ask that question why aren't you doing stuff more horizontal stuff it's so much easier than, than doing the verticals um, so I, I don't know maybe I don't answer it in any depth it's just that it, it certainly does give that opportunity I mean we're approaching ours purely from a material development point of view but it does it does bring in um, other conversations of perceptions and how people uh, view this kind of technology as general which we always talk about aesthetics but we, we always see parks and gardens as healthy yet we see microbes as as unhealthy because we associate them with illness and so why there there certainly is a lot of horizontal and other other kind of surfaces within the urban fabric that you could do this to it, it needs it does need a change in perception from how people view these kind of things in order that you could apply it because going back to the conversations of housing you know where, where do you apply this kind of technologies too. I, I guess it's probably going to be easier on public buildings at the moment than houses because people might not necessarily want this kind of stuff growing and when you're talking about spa urban spaces where people can walk directly up to, the, up to this and interact with it, certainly from our point of view with exposed organisms, people don't necessarily like that. Um, and so there does need to be a shift I think in the way people perceive nature. Um, now how that happens surely comes from designers but also comes through the, the policies that you talk about as well um, I don't know if I'm really answering your question because I didn't I didn't hear it properly but I, I think if at this point do you want to just come in some minutes you haven't had a chance uh, yet so sure yeah no just um, to say that partially also the, the reason why we focus so much on buildings is that um, there is a question of the inside and the outside right of that envelope that uh, is the basis on which then we uh, find the metrics for things like um, energy efficiency. Um, and so it is partially also about um, understanding a new way of inhabiting that really has uh, uh, a more unified relationship 
with the environment. Uh, so when we talk about housing as well, uh, houses typically are an envelope that's trying to be as sealed as possible from, from the environment. What, what happens if, if we break that seal and if we start using the, and processing the environment through um, our inhabited spaces? And, and what kind of metrics and ways of evaluating sustainability, for instance, uh, would that bring about? And would we have to change the way we live? Because uh, it, it's easy enough to provide sort of greening techniques or, or uh, sustainability solutions where we don't have to make any effort. With you know, we can keep uh, living within um, the same kind of modern paradigms that we've used so far. But what happens when we actually have to to do something to, to, to change the way we live to maybe use less electricity because the electricity is provided partially by a wall in a living room or to get habituated with a certain s slight smell because that's the bacteria in our walls. Uh, you know, what, what kind of changes would, would happen there as well? Well, at that point, maybe we should go and encounter the smell that might be in the wall. Um, <laughs> you, can, you can tend to have a, a beer alongside it if you want. Um, but I'd like to thank, first of all, very much our speakers. I'd also like to thank Trimo for sponsoring the evening. And I thank you all for coming. And if you want more information on any of the projects, obviously you can see the things upstairs. If you go onto our website, there's deep information and there's links out and all that kind of thing. So thank you very much for coming again. Thank you.